Hello everyone, my name is Celia Pavalev and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Australia Council for the Arts. I'm your MC again. I'd like to acknowledge the Kamaragal peoples, the traditional owners of the land from which I'm coming to you. I'd also like to acknowledge the many nations throughout Australia that we are gathering from here online to talk about culture, platforms and adapting digitally. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge all First Nations peoples on our panel today and present and online in this session. This is Reconciliation Week. I think there are two days to go today and tomorrow. And this year's theme in this together is now resonating in ways we could never ever have foreseen when it was chosen. Um, it reminds us whether we we're in a crisis or in reconciliation, that we are all in this together. And I couldn't agree more, particularly in this little forum that we gather together with each Tuesday at two o'clock. This afternoon, we're joined by five panelists. Like I said before, our biggest panel ever. Um, I'm very, very grateful to all of you for joining. We have Beck and Tristan, Moena, Damien and Ian. So we've got a huge amount of conversations and content to get through this afternoon. Um, very quick little bit of housekeeping. If you are joining us um, via Zoom and if you'd like to send us a little question, there's a little Q&A box in the toolbar across the bottom of your screen. And if you're watching us through Facebook Live, there's also the chat. So we actually, technically, just so you know how we're doing this, it's a Zoom session that we're sending out through Facebook Live. Um, closed captions are also available through Zoom by clicking on the closed caption icon on the bottom menu bar. And we're also joined by our extremely talented Auslan interpreters, Elisa and Bettina for this session as well. So without further ado, I love saying that every week, let's kick off and we'll start with Beck and Tristan today from All the Queen's Men. Uh, Beck is an Australian based performer, producer, director, choreographer and engagement specialist. And together with Tristan Meacham, Beck leads All the Queen's Men, is a founding member of Everybody Now with Kate McDonald and Ian Pidd and regularly collaborates with acclaimed Australian artists, Madeline Flynn and Tim Humphrey. Tristan is an artist performer and the co-artistic director of All the Queen's Men. Previously, Tristan was artistic director of Give It Up for Margaret, a month long festival inspiring innovative arts philanthropy, a creative lead for Going Nowhere, a sustainable international arts exchange at Arts House and artistic associate and philanthropic manager of AFIDS. Beck and Tristan will share their insights into creating accessible online properties for the LGBTIQ community, combating isolation and overcoming barriers in this digital landscape. Over to you, Beck. Thank you so much, Celia. Hello, everybody. My name's Beck. I have the great honour of joining you from Luturicha. I'm down in Tasmania looking at the snow on the mountains. And together with Tristan, All the Queen's Men is a company that's passionate about communities. And we've been going for about 10 years now. Um, we're based in Melbourne and we had been working locally, nationally and internationally. Um, and until recently, we, most of our work was heading overseas and now we find ourselves here. That's, there's my art wife. Here we are at LGBTI Elders Dance Club, which is a project that we'd like to talk to you about today. All the Queen's Men is primarily passionate about collaborating with people of all shapes and sizes and identities to really create experiences that are about social transformation. So I'm going to pass to Tristan to tell you about some of the work we've been doing over the last five years, specifically focused on supporting members, older members of the LGBTI plus 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 community. And here are some of our gorgeous, um, oh, what do we call them, our, oh, our sort of sacred High Council, there's Ardi there. These are folks that we collaborated with on a project that we started about four years ago called the Coming Back Out Ball, which was really about combating isolation and ageism, homophobia, lesbophobia, transphobia, specifically for older LGBTI members of the community. Yeah, thank, thanks, Beck. It's important to note um, we have made a, a pretty significant um, community uh, 
community um, uh, uh, commitment to um, supporting LGBTI elders. Um, important to note that this is um, a generation who have lived through historical discrimination in Australia where um, your gender, sexual or cultural identity could have resulted in imprisonment, um, uh, forced medical cures and being rejected from family and friends. Um, and uh, as uh, a young gay man myself and as Beck as a wonderful ally to the LGBTIQAP plus community, we were pretty horrified that the elders of our community, the pioneers who have led the way, shaped um, the values and the um, uh, ideals that we've been able to um, live in current day weren't being heralded as um, the kings, queens and non-binary royalty that they absolutely deserve. Um, and our offer was really about creating creative action that connected community in large civic spaces, really thinking around visibility that celebrates elders, but also acknowledges that many elders um, of the community are actually coming out in later age. Some people have found only the confidence to be their true sexual, gendered or cultural identities as they um, move into their later life. And so the Coming Back Out Ball is a large project that we created and has been running every year uh, in Melbourne at the Melbourne Town Hall. Uh, we've all had a wonderful program, a cultural program that has featured the likes of Deborah Cheatham, Electric Fields, Robin Archer, Lois Weaver, and we are showing off a little bit because last year we had the one and only Yo-Yo Ma and I got to put a feather boa on him. Pretty good uh, life goals. Um, but we're here obviously to talk about um, the LGBTI Elders Dance Club, which is a monthly dance club that we have run for the last um, six years now, five years, beg your pardon, um, every month. It's usually run uh, at the Melba Spiegel Tent, supported by the City of Yarra and the Victorian Seniors Festival. Um, and it's an, a project that augments our um, larger visible celebrations of the Coming Back Out Ball. It's smaller in scale. It's really about building community and providing a safe space for LGBTI elders to come in however they uh, like. Um, anonymity is really important. People uh, can come and be whoever they want to be in that time. Uh, each month, we've always had people coming for the very first time and using this as an opportunity to celebrate who they, ver who they are. So obviously during these times uh, um, that we're facing, these turbulent times, um, it was very important for Beck and I um, to create an event, to continue this event. And we were obviously dealt with the strange times of not being able to commune together and not being able to celebrate and not being able to do the very thing of touch, which was so very important for a group of people who wouldn't necessarily even have a hug uh, 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 during the month. This was their only time to commune, to celebrate, to be treated um, like uh, royalty and, and um, uh, we, we want to work in, uh, pretty quickly to continue this space. So um, for, I think it's our sixth um, presentation every fortnight, we've now created an online event called Digital Dance Club. Digital Dance Club works in the same form. It's a place of being able to support people to really hold and commune together with LGBTI elders. Um, and it works on Zoom. We've had to shift and change and there's been some really um, complex um, technical um, issues in terms of older people and their understanding of cultural competency within these new formats and how to actually support them. There's a tension that we're facing um, as um, a company because a lot of people um, who have come to Digital Dance Club uh, un are unable to use things like uh, Zoom and don't have connections to the internet. We both Beck uh, and I also haven't been home for four months. We got stranded when we're in the UK. So we're also in this very interesting position of not being able to go out and meet the very people that we try to support and, um, and um, partner and dance and celebrate with each month. It's, a, it's an interesting tension for us as a company as well, thinking around um, uh, digital diversity um, and, and th those that are able to commune online and continue to connect. And we're well aware, and one of the great things that we're thinking about at the moment is for our elders, elders uh, in our community who do not have the capacity to be online and to communicate and connect and be fatigued by Zooms because it's not um, um, everyone has not had necessarily had that um, opportunity. Um, we are, uh, are struggling to, to 
think around what we need to be doing to connect. Interestingly, though, there's a wonderful um, flip side. There are people that are joining us in Digital Dance Club for the very first time from the safety of their own homes without having to come out literally, um, but uh, absolutely be able to come out metaphorically and join us and celebrate. The project is connecting elders across Australia now. It is making sure that people don't necessarily feel so siloed. And by actually being able to share stories across uh, all the wonderful nations uh, here in Australia has been an incredibly joyous thing. So we're now faced with this interesting tension, uh, interesting um, possibility. Possibility. We'll continue um, uh, to present Digital Dance Club uh, despite whatever eventuates into the immediate future, simply because we know that there are a group of people who would prefer to commune and celebrate uh, and meet uh, on uh, the platform of Zoom. It's created like a party each and every fortnight. We've had some wonderful um, uh, queer performers that celebrate and perform, and Beck can make anyone dance, even the most uh, curmudgeons like myself move about quite freely. But we'll also look at um, trying to think about being able to come back together to be able to hold to commune, uh, to celebrate and dance together. Um, Beck? Just to wrap up, everyone, that Digital Dance Club is actually a really positive example of a digital pivot. Um, we were really nervous at first. Would our beloved community come along? We average about 80 attendants every fortnight and they're all primarily 65 to 85. So we're thrilled. They're coming. Now the borders have all dissolved. They're coming from all over Australia. And now we're getting more and more international guests coming along. So this has actually just been a really great thing that has arisen that we couldn't have possibly imagined. Um, and, and even more so because it's targeted and about supporting a particular community that may not necessarily be the first people we think about when we think about digital competency and diversity. So and one of the say that it's been a great experience ironically <laughs> one of the things that um all the queens <laughs> is um uh is also um ensuring that our company now starts looking at providing opportunities for older people to um learn about the internet um get skills around um connecting on zoom so that we can get more members joining us in the digital space to support uh elders needs uh in in older people's needs in in um into the future as well we're looking at some of the initiatives that are being run by department of human health and services in terms of training that we can then start providing for older people to learn we'll do some zoom training classes together um, and hopefully use that as a way uh, forward. Um, and another project that we are working with is with the Victorian Seniors Festival as well, an online program of events that will run till October, really placing older um, uh, Australian performers at the forefront. Um, uh, and um, I guess there's an interesting thing. I know that there's a lot of digital fatigue um, uh, with a lot of people in the arts community around whether to put things online or not. But for us, um, it's a very different context because older people aren't necessarily getting the saturation of culture culture um, and experience that maybe we are privileged within our artistic communities. Uh, many older people are socially isolated and these moments online, one moment of celebration of hearing Kutcher Edwards sing or Deborah Cheatham sing uh, as being programmed in the Victorian Seniors Festival or Lee uh, Tanya Kernigan uh, perform uh, a country music classic has been really joyous. Um, so thank you so much for letting us join. Thank you. I, I have a quick question before before we move on. Um, I'll just turn my video back on. Sorry. I was just trying to keep it keep it on the down low there. Um, if you were to give advice to a, a council, like maybe a local council or a small group who were quite overwhelmed by the pivot quite, quite, quite quickly and their primary audience are maybe our, 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 older, our elders, our, our older populations, if you had to give them like the top three tips of what not to be afraid of, that they might have just gone, oh, no, this isn't going to work, what would they be? What would you, what advice would you give? Something that I've learnt, Celia, thank you. It's a great question. I'm um, working a lot across projects with people over 75 at the moment. And the first thing we're all telling ourselves is to just acknowledge that there is a lot of fear so acknowledge the fear, number one, but actually we're going to work into this new world together. So that's been tip one for all of us, with, particularly with that group of over 70s we've been working with. 
it's scary. It might feel scary, but actually we'll work it out together. Um, that's been certainly something really positive. Um, and number two that I've been thinking about a lot is just keep asking your primary participants, attendees, audience, what is it that they really need? Because it mightn't be what we think it is. Um, for some people, it's, it might be, actually, yes, can somebody please bring their computer to my home with an internet dongle and sit here and do it with me because I don't actually have the internet? Or actually, I just love a phone call once a week. Can we have a go? So keep asking people, what is it that they really need, I think? And, and, I, and because the world is changing so rapidly, let's keep doing that. Tristan? Top and also, you know, um, as is always done in such a beautiful way in First Nation cultures where they're respecting elders, we are led by the community that we uh, want to collaborate with, that we're making sure that we're always listening, I think is a really important thing to, um, to the LGBTI elders and their diversity and their individual needs. As Beck says, um, we try to create um, uh, a community movement, but um, our process is definitely a relational process of listening to each individual and making sure that we're being responsive to everyone's needs. Um, it requires a lot of uh, work, but that work is absolutely the reason why we're doing it, to ensure that everyone feels connected and feels um, part of something uh, bigger, especially when those people don't necessarily have the rights of being aligned with a creative community in the first place. Yeah, I think it, it, you nailed it there saying, you know, listening and, and listening to needs, because I think, you know, at council, similar thing and that's how this particular group came up as well listening to needs and actually responding to that and also the fear thing like I think if we were all really honest with ourselves this whole thing has given us a sense of fear in one way shape or another and, and just acknowledging that and just knowing that together we can actually kind of combat anything really and, and find different ways of, of doing things. Maybe one more thing for councils is also, even though we're in a period of fear, to realise the power of the creative arts and also to imbue that with a sense of joy and activeness as well, because even though we are in very challenging times, one of the things that we've made sure Digital Dance Club is, is one of the most joyous parties that you'll be able to join online. And as a result, that joy is able to live in people's bodies, even though it's through a digital space. You see that through a connection. And so it's important to maintain uh, a sense of celebration, honouring and joy for the very people that may not have those privileges at this time as well. And then we can look forward to that hug. And I am so, so, so jealous of the Yo-Yo Ma moment. I have to say, such a fan. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. I can't she believe played, She agree. played Dancing Queen. She played Dancing Queen. So cool. One of my favourite songs as well. That's extraordinary. Okay. All right. Moving on to Morwenna. Morwenna is um, one of our dear colleagues from the Australia Council, um, an arts, diversity and inclusion consultant. In this rapidly evolving environment, have we remembered to engage the needs of artists with disability? And what do we need to do to consider as we move forward into the recovery stage? Moena, as an accomplished leader, consultant and facilitator with over 15 years experience in government, arts, not-for-profit and the university sectors, has worn the hats of CEO, senior management team member, project manager, lecturer, researcher, trainer and advisor. I'm exhausted saying all of that. And Moena currently lectures at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, consults to various arts organisations and is an accessibility advisor for the City of Sydney, Sydney Festival and Perth Festival. Moena, over to you. Uh, hi, Celia and everyone. Lovely to be with you today. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on today, the Gadigal, uh, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging um, of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And for anyone joining us today that might find this useful, I also thought I'd briefly audio describe myself. Uh, so I'm a white woman, uh, mid-ish 30s, uh, with dark brown hair and black glasses. And today I'm wearing a mustard coloured jumper with some colourful triangles uh, on it. Um, so as we've already talked about, we're in such a unique uh, time in our history as an art sector and also as a society right now. And absolutely, Celia agree that it's it's got its challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunities here. Um, 
I'm someone who identifies as a disabled person and someone who's living with an invisible impairment. And I guess my access requirements aren't obvious and they wouldn't know what uh, you wouldn't know what they are unless uh, you ask me. So I think today I wanted to talk a little bit about access and inclusion in this time, uh, particularly as a lot of us have had this real mad rush to pivot all of our work to the online space. Um, there can be a risk, I guess, that um, we're not always including people from diverse backgrounds. And, um, you know, today I hope to share some tips about what we need to do to make sure that we're providing what people need so that they can participate fully. So I'll just quickly share my screen with you um, and there were three things that I wanted to spend the time talking about today. Um, and the first is around representation. So I think um, a really important thing for me is um, I'm always trying to learn from and get to know the work of more artists and arts workers from diverse backgrounds. So I think as arts workers and artists, we've got a real um, responsibility to seek people out. Um, I love following different thought leaders and those active on social media um, from the disability community world. Um, Kelly Finlay is one of my favourites at the moment. Um, and also uh, I try and make sure that I'm informing myself um, about things and doing my own research. So um, a lot of people are spending a bit of time on Netflix at the moment. There's a great documentary called Crip Camp, which talks about the disability rights movement in the US. Um, and I'm also really enjoying listening to podcasts uh, such as Listen Able by Dylan Alcott. And I think once we found out about people. Um, obviously, it's really important to include them when you're hosting events, webinars, panels, and of course, in our artistic work as well. And of course, not just programming diverse people on the diversity panel, but on all panels. And I know this is something that the Australia Council has been doing really well throughout its webinar series. But I thought I'd just give you a couple of ideas from my community, the disability community of where you can go to find out about some more artists um, working in this space. So next week, um, we've got the beginning of the Sydney Film Festival happening in our very own lounge rooms. And while this festival have really had to pare back their program this year, one thing they have uh, committed to keeping is the screenability films. Um, with disabled creatives making new uh, short films for this festival, which I think is going to be really exciting. And another initiative that's happening at the moment is Arts Front have been running their little lunches online, which I'm sure many of us have joined. And every Thursday they've committed to profiling or featuring artists with disability. So that's been a really great way to find out more about um, artists that you might not have come across. And a couple of international examples, uh, Grey Eye Theatre in the UK um, and also Disability Arts Online in the UK are doing some really great profiling um, of international disabled artists right now. So there's a couple of suggestions to keep you going. My second uh, tip is around encouraging us all to think about access and inclusion across all of your digital content um, in the way that you would be doing, I should hope, for your in-person events as well. So the key thing here for me is asking people what they need. Um, as, as a disabled person, it's much easier for me to be asked about my access rather than having to worry about asking for access uh, from an organisation when I don't know whether or not that access is going to be provided. So, um, and it's also great, of course, to proactively provide access like the captioning and uh, sign language interpretation we've got here today. Um, so when you're putting a panel together like this one, just that simple question to panellists um, at the beginning of the process around do you have any access requirements um, is really great. And also I think um, providing some guidance to presenters uh, that you're working with around how to be inclusive in their presentation. So um, potentially what sort of language to use, whether uh, you'd like them to do a short audio description such as I did today. Um, so having a guide that you can share with your panel is really, really useful as well. And there's loads of good information online about how to make your online events accessible. Uh, accessible Arts have a great top 10 tips that they've just released. Um, there's a couple of blogs that have just come out of the UK from uh, thought leaders Joe Verrant and Sarah Pickthall. Um, and in terms of artistic content, um, 
obviously that's really important to make accessible as well. It's been great to see um, theatre companies and galleries doing performances and tours online at the moment, but in Australia, I'm not sure, and I, I really hope someone can um, correct to me, but I haven't seen any theatre performances, for example, that are sign language interpreted or captioned um, out as yet. So when you when you are providing that digital content online, making sure um, that you're providing the access to go along with it so that everyone, um, any, every one of your audience members can join you in that. And I think um, another thing that has obviously happened across our sector quite quickly is there's been a lot of rapid response grant opportunities popping up um, to support people during this really difficult time. And I think thinking about access when doing responsive um, activities like this is really important um, because I think sometimes in our haste to put something online and get money out the door, um, access can be forgotten. So just a couple of examples and not to not to call anyone out in particular, um, we can we can all do better at this, but there was a, a philanthropic fund maybe about a month ago, which had, I think it was announced on the Thursday and closed on the Sunday. And that gave people about three days to submit an application. And for a lot of people with disability and a lot of people generally, that just wasn't enough time. So I think time is a really interesting factor around access. And then also um, technical accessibility with grants as well is really important. Um, I know at the moment the Australia Council's recently launched its new online grants portal and I know it's had some feedback which I'm, I know it's very quickly responding to around um, some issues that that system has uh, engaging with screen readers, which people who are blind or visually impaired use to apply for grants. So I think the key thing for me here is um, really taking some time to do some user testing if you are about to launch um, an opportunity. So um, obviously your web or your, your IT developer will tell you something is a certain level of accessibility, but there's nothing quite as um, useful as having real people um, with disability testing things for you. So that's something else to think about. And my third thing to leave you with today is using this time to plan how you could be more inclusive in the future. So obviously some of us are finding ourselves with perhaps an unusual amount of downtime at the moment and thinking about how we can tackle some of the things that we might not have gotten to yet in our busy everyday lives. So some examples are um, doing some disability inclusion training which you can do with consultants with lived experience such as myself or organisations such as Accessible Arts uh, which can easily be done online um, and thinking about things like uh, writing a disability action plan which um, are a great document in terms of uh, consulting with your community to again as our previous presenters talked about um, finding out what it is that they need and then building a plan to building a plan to, to help you get there. Um, things like adding diversity to your regular team meeting agendas um, or joining an online networking or information gathering such as ATAG run by Accessible Arts. So I think there's a lot of opportunities here and hopefully um, I've given you a few ideas of some things that you could um, have a look at in your own practice and work as we move forward. So thank you. Thanks, Morwenna. Um, Again, listening and looking out for needs and responding to needs is such a strong message coming through. Um, oops, start my video. Forgot to start my video. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, listening to um, needs and making sure that we're actually responding in the, in that to those particular needs. Um, and something else that you did touch on was that quick response and that sense of urgency that I know artists, organisations, funding bodies, all manner of respondents uh, are, are doing quite quickly and not necessarily giving everyone enough time or are taking the time to get it right, are they? Is that Absolutely. And and I know there's so much goodwill around doing this and no one wants to not do the right thing. Um, and, you know, access can, doing access well can take time, it can take resources and budget. Um, 
it, but for me, it's just a no-brainer in terms of making sure that um, it's something that is open to everyone if that's what it's supposed to be. So um, I think there's a lot of learnings that are coming out um, from this time as well in terms of how can we make a quick response grant program accessible? You know, what sort of accessible formats can you accept grant applications or, you know, festival submissions or whatever it might be in? Um, and how can we make sure that we give our community enough time to respond to these um, quick opportunities as well? And what support might we be able to provide uh, to people to be able to do that as well? And I, I mean, I, we found ourselves, Australia Council, in um, similar situations in trying to actually get information out quite quickly. And I have never lived in an environment where the messaging was changing so rapidly and so quickly. And your burning desire is to share that information so quickly, but you're also very conscious that the single or the one or two formats that you're putting that information out on is not accessible to everyone um, immediately. And yeah. that, you know, so do you recommend getting it out there and then building up those alternate, the other formats as well? Or is, you know, is that... Is yeah, that look, it's a, I think it depends on the situation and I think that can work really well um, along with a message that, um, you know, further accessible formats or whatever it might be are coming. Um, so just yeah. communicating very clearly that it's coming and also I think it's, it's an attitudinal thing of just being really open and welcoming, um, encouraging feedback from people too, you know, making it really clear um, that you are interested in hearing from people about what would make it work uh, best for them. So I think it's, you know, for me, it ultimately comes down to, you know, attitudinal approaches to all of this. And I think with the right intent, that usually comes across, um, but with the thought and work behind the scenes to, you know, to get that accessibility happening really quickly um, as well, because obviously you don't want to disadvantage people who are already disadvantaged in all of this as well. That's exactly right. And it, it's, it's, it, that's what has been an enormous challenge to not just to get information out there and to, um, to make sure that it is at, you know, as, in as, as many accessible formats as you can do quite quickly and then to keep building it. But so if we are missing any formats, please, anyone from the audience, um, don't hesitate to do let us know if we're, you know, if you need something a bit sooner or quicker than what we're able to do. But we find ourselves in that exact same, same boat as well. But we are listening and we are, try, again, trying to meet needs at the same time and, and trying to um, ensure that everyone does have equal and, and the same access to every single message and opportunity and everything that that comes out as well thanks Mawena um, and I think this we continue on with looking at the digital environment and making sure that people and everyone can actually access information as we start to turn our thoughts now towards our First Nations peoples and capturing and curating identity and, and a sense of custodianship our next guests will take this provocation a step further, Damien Webb and Ian R.T. Collis. Uh, Damien is Manager of Indigenous Engagement Branch at the State Library of New South Wales. Damien's previous work with the State Library of West Australia focused on digital keeping places and the return of Aboriginal collections through the Successful Storylines projects. With an academic background in human rights, his passion is ensuring that archives and libraries are equipped to decolonize and interrogate their collections and to work with Aboriginal communities to ensure voices and collections are recognized and preserved. Ian R.T. Collis, another colleague from the Australia Council, um, is the Australia Council Custodianship Programs Facilitator and Program Manager. Ian is a graduate of so many um, institutions here, the, New, the Newtown High School of the Performing Arts, holding a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Queensland University of Technologies Creative Industries, a Bachelor of Arts from the Edith Cowan University's West Australian Academy of the Performing Arts, and he also holds a Master of Arts from the New York, New York University's Steinhardt School of Culture Education and Human Development. I'll leave it to you boys to take us somewhere. Off you go. Uh, hi everyone, um, being from a library background, I'm going to quickly run through a couple of quite boring slides. I apologize for the, the visuals. Um, the context that we work in in libraries, uh, when we use language like access and inclusion, 
is sometimes a little bit different. So hopefully this will uh, just help set a little bit of a context. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you live uh, on Gadigal country, um, and particularly this week, as we're seeing around the world, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, our First Nations people uh, and the ongoing um, oppression and misrepresentation that we are dealing with. Uh, my family are Palawa from Tasmania, uh, so I'm out of country, um, but I've been working in libraries for about 10 years now, um, focusing largely on inclusion and representation, and particularly the fact that kind of at the heart of representation are issues of power and identity, and these are really complicated by the historic and ongoing denial of Aboriginal self-representation. So as some of the other presenters have touched on, um, we tend to define what people need uh, without necessarily talking to them. And that's um, been the cause of a lot of issues. Uh, so the Indigenous Engagement Branch where I work at the library is a specialised branch of Indigenous staff uh, who more or less our role is to bridge the gap between Aboriginal communities and the institution uh, and really getting the institution to recognise the history and legacy that we have uh, and challenge that idea that, that libraries and information and collections can, can or have been neutral spaces particularly ensuring that in this rapid creation of new online spaces and tools that we don't just replicate the issues that we've had before. So in terms of access, libraries and archives, a big driver for us is digitization. So, so making physical collections accessible online. Um, but we do have a tendency to pretty much just scan things as is. And for Aboriginal collections, we know that the uh, offensive and racist language and context that goes along with those materials needs to be interrogated and changed. Unfortunately, the way that automa automation is happening, a lot of those opportunities are missed. So we don't have as many staff taking the time to look at the material that's being digitized. So we are ending up with material online that does cause harm to Aboriginal communities. Additionally, when we assess risks, uh, particular on projects, we're usually assessing the risk to the institution and we do need to be looking at the risks that projects have for Aboriginal cultural safety and intellectual and political structures. Uh, it's very easy for projects that mean well to actually undermine um, community politics and uh, structures that are already in place. And I've seen many institutions kind of plow into situations with no awareness of the local politics uh, and things can backfire very, very quickly. The digital born collections that are around at the moment, uh, I'm sure everyone watching is aware, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, Aboriginal content, music, art being created online and is born online. And the library is actually quite well equipped to deal with that. It's one of the few areas in our collections where we are actually able to collect contemporary Aboriginal perspectives a lot more easily dealing with the historical legacies and the gaps in the collection is, is much, much trickier. Um, inclusion, um, you hear the phrase Aboriginal perspectives, institutions want to bring Aboriginal perspectives, want to celebrate Aboriginal perspectives. I've, I've very rarely heard that um, clarified. What, what does that actually mean? And what limits do we place on that inclusion and consultation? And more importantly, who decides when that consultation inclusion is necessary and what those limits are? There are real costs to Aboriginal people and communities. Elders are often very time poor. And as institutions, we don't, don't often value that enough. We are seeing a shift. Uh, the library recently did a, an exhibition around Cook called Eight Days in Kamei, which was shifting the perspective of um, a quite precious part of, of Australian history. Basically shifting away from telling Indigenous stories to empowering Indigenous storytellers. That, that, that shift is kind of at the crux of it. There was an elder that I worked with many years ago who, who described, um, used a term called pretty business, which is, is basically um, like a reconciliation morning tea where, where nothing really happens, it's just for show. So trying to avoid those, those really quite empty gestures and wasting the time of, of elders and activists and knowledge holders. Uh, the last point is, is on authority that we, actually have to develop tangible mechanisms that are kind of recognized as best practice for dealing with authority and representation. There are um, there's a framework that the library will be releasing shortly on intellectual property, intellectual cultural property. Um, we've worked on with Terry Janke, which rather than 
aim for some aspirational goal, we're actually looking to put, put hard mechanisms in that control what can and can't be seen and where that authority actually sits. So um, recent projects like Gather, we're building digital and local keeping places with communities. So moving away from the idea that everything has to be centralized and instead providing communities and individuals with the tools they need to actually do, do this work themselves. Um, and I suppose more importantly, you hear a lot about repatriation of, of objects, remains, materials. What we aren't necessarily doing is repatriating the stolen authority that we, we still claim over a lot of these materials. So I'm, I'm gonna get rid of the slides now and um, throw over to Ian. Are you there, Ian? <laughs> Can you see me? Brother, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And it was really, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, it was really great to hear what you, 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 you're you doing and your contributions to your people. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting you and your, what you're doing at the, uh, the State Library of uh, New South Wales is really pioneering. And I, I hope you don't mind me saying that I know that your ancestrals uh, would be rightly proud of you. So... Thank you. As I am too. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. I'm just going to quickly share a bit of a presentation, I guess. And then I want to really, can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then I want to have a bit of a yarn and just go old school. Yeah. I'm wearing a lovely tie that Auntie um, Henrietta from the Yedinji people got me. So I'd like to pay my respects to her. And I'm wearing a beautiful Tiwi shirt. So I'm, and I'm wearing my uh, Michael Jackson, Billie Jean jacket. So I'm feeling pretty reconciliation out. Um, can't do a reconciliation event, but you know, I can make like an event happening on me, um, which I think is rather fabulous. So here we are, we find ourselves today at Think Inside the Square. With that, we have to take opportunity to start to think where we are. I, as a Dara black man of the Gundangara, I pay my deep respect to the Gadigal of the Eora where I stand today. As a coexisting member of the oldest surviving cultures in the world, indeed the known universe, I am a result of this never-never, the dreaming. I am a result, or what my grandmother, the late Auntie Dawn Collis, would remind, remind me of frequently, a byproduct of reconciliation. I ask you, as my grandmother has before us, to take our hand and to stand with us, my peoples, to listen, not just acknowledge, to put back to action, to be open to learn and to walk forward in the true transformative uh, notion of reconciliation and to join with us a story that is older than time itself. In paying respect to country, I describe it. Gadigal, this country, is a country surrounded by salt water, light and sky. It is a country that is, has magnificent cliff faces with oceans smashing into it, daily carving its existence. It is small to medium slopes, and very few mountains, abundant in cheerful birds who sing me awake every morning. I pay my deep respect to elders past, present, and our future, and elders who are with us today, Aboriginal brothers and Torres Strait Islander sisters, um, and also our non-Indigenous contemporaries. To describe myself orderly, I am a queer man in my early to mid late thirties with brown messy hair, black Harry Potter style glasses with a red tie from the Yerenji, a Tiwi shirt in front of an abstract cultural painting in my lounge room. So, what am I? I believe that with time and through my cultural, artistic and human development, I've become what I term a multicultural, multi-art form and multi-generational practitioner. 
I am a great cultural cocktail. I go down really well. Some people like me, some people don't, but that's how I roll. I'm from the Darabalap clan of the Gunungara, from the World Heritage List of Blue Mountains, in which we share with the Darak people. And I pay my deep respects to those people. I'm a custodian. Um, it is my cultural right and my responsibility. And I daily think about this every time I put on my red socks in the morning. My skin is my custodianship. I am a byproduct of reconciliation and I'm proud to be who I am. I am queer and I have two families. I have a biological family and I have a gay family. And I too echo uh, from all the Queen's men uh, the notion of uh, eldership that I've had, whether it be from uh, Peter and Jason, who have been involved in my uh, in, uh, queer and human development, um, or whether it be through my Indigenous uh, queer uh, LGBTQI development or sister girl development, whether it be Uncle Raymond Blanco, uh, Jacob Bowen, um, Dion Hastings, uh, uh, Uncle uh, Noel Tolvi, the list goes on. I consider myself CACD, emerging, experimental and multi-art form with my experiences um, that have seen me as the artistic director of Untitled Collective on the side now for over 13 years. I believe I would consider myself to be an untitled interdisciplinary cultural practitioner. I'm also involved as the manager of the custodianship program. The custodianship program is a very unique program that has had deep support and was seeded by an idea at the Australia Council and endorsed by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Strategy Panel, now formally known as the First Nations Arts Strategy Panel, headed by Wesley Enoch and an abundant uh, array of uh, great talent and cultural leaders for our people. The custodianship program is for cultural practitioners and workers, arts workers from across art forms and across career levels. The program encourages participants who are at various stages of their career and who are now ready to take a time to reflect on the skills, capacity, and what custodianship and or leadership means to them in a contemporary world in which we find ourselves today. The program attracts learners who are open to new ideas and able to work in a group situation and who are willing to share knowledge and insights with other participants and who have roots with their custodianship responsibilities and want to learn more about how they enact a vision for their community. To provide some background on the custodianship program, the Australian Council for the Arts launched the program in 2019 um, and the first cohort started in February 2020. The program provides cultural practitioners and arts workers across the career levels to reflect on what custodianship means to them in diverse contexts. Here is this wonderful community, the inaugural custodianship program. And these are the wonderful people who have to put up with me. And um, they're absolutely extraordinary. We have Auntie Associate Professor Henrietta Murray. We have Dion, um, uh, uh, Dean Greeno. We have Maria Randall. We have Baranga Wawadri. We have uh, Jilda Andrews. We have Alicia Longsdale. We have Mark Edical Paulson as a core facilitator. We have uh, Cynthia Mansell. Um, we have Zane Saunders. We have Hannah Donnelly. We have Vanessa Elliott. We have Nakima Williams. We have Mark Cora, Joe Dreesens, uh, Emily McDaniels. And of course, we have the wonderful Mr. Ian RT on the side. We just finished our first, cast just before the cohort, uh, the, this COVID-19 or corona uh, pandemic had entered the climate of our existence, our first residential in Gokunyaranji country in the Daintree, which is the most diverse uh, rainforest and the oldest surviving rainforest in the world. So I pay my deep respects to those people. It occurred between the 14th to the 18th and it was extraordinary. But then we found ourselves in COVID-19. So what was I to do? The residential two was about to occur in Kakadu and I wanted not to send, at the time I was getting a lot of emails about people canceling things. 
And I talked to Auntie uh, Henrietta, our elder in residence, and Mark Yiddick Paulson, um, and Lydia Miller, um, uh, and uh, Kevin uh, Duprez, my manager. And I asked them, well, I think we need to start to question what is culture in the digital space? And I also echo these conversations, as Damien has talked about, um, with Dr. Terry Jenke, um, who is a extraordinary uh, Torres Strait Islander woman who has an ability to look at what inter-Indigenous uh, cultural property right is um, and how one might do this in the digital space. So we then entered what is custodianship program online gathering sessions. So far, we've had six sessions. They've been very successful. The first session involved me individually calling each participant, spending the time, a kappa, if you will, to have that yarn and to have that time to just check into that person and how they're dealing in the climate of crisis. Extraordinarily, of course, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are used to crisis because as soon as those boats arrived 200 or whatever years ago with a person named Lieutenant Cook, who they have idolised and now called Captain Cook, this isn't my biased opinion, this is what the, this is what the academic institutions can teach us, um, we then, you know, had to start to question um, where we are today. So um, I, I needed to make sure that I took that time to take that time with each individual. The second session, Mark Hitika Paulson and I had Zoom sessions with each of them, having them to respond to questions around the theme they've been before we started in the um, second session. So we're able to pre-impact the syllabus and curriculum of the custodianship program in real time um, and to better tailor the content. The third session then saw us gathering and having all of the participants gather on an online Zoom session headed by Auntie Henrietta, our elder in residence, and so on and so forth for the fourth, fifth and sixth session. And through the, all of these sessions, the cultural, uh, the custodianship program community have been doing creative explorations around the themes of being. Um, we've worked to make sure that the custodianship program had digital resources. Some of them didn't have laptops or in, um, uh, in, Intel or computers. So I worked with a festival and um, members of the program to make sure that this was um, available to them. Because as the same thing that has happened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our education systems is that a large amount of our younger brothers and sisters, which is the largest uh, populations of Indigenous cultures, in Australia have, have had um, a, a unconscious discrimination occur in, in the context of not having access to internet and or computers so that they can have basic schooling. B, it also required us to do upskilling of individual groups, of diverse age groups, clan groups, language groups to develop digital accesses in isolated, remote, urban, suburban contexts. It was a um, C, online dialogues, D, online mentorings, E, it was gatherings. What is gatherings in the digital space? F, it was skills workshops. And G, of course, cultural and creative explorations. I've also been involved in creative connections with the capacity building team. We've had the Dr. Terry Jenke, who I pre-impacted two months ago before this COVID-19 started to happen, and asked her, what is protocols in the digital space? And that is now echoed into other conversations, which is really ex extraordinary. We've had Dr. Tristan from the Gil Millaroy people uh, several weeks ago talking about workshops and facilitations. Tomorrow we have Auntie Dr. Uh, Janara Garangarang um, from the Waka Waka people who will be discussing at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, register, understanding self as a leader in times of crisis. And then finally, we'll have Mark Utica Paulson from the um, Bichala and the uh, 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 Bundjalan people um, uh, talk about uh, intercultural workings. And finally, the last thing I'd like to discuss with you is that we have our First Nations Roundtable that occurs every Friday. Please join with the chair um, of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Strategy Panel, the wonderful, the delightful, the charming Wesley Enoch, and of course, the beautiful Leanne Buckskin. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ian, and thank you, Damien. I just have like to, to sort of throw something sort of um, into the conversation. I think um, you you both come from a, a space of leadership and and custodianship, clearly looking ensuring um, 
that First Nations artwork and, and archives are, are, are respected and, and held. Um, in, in the concept of leadership in this digital environment here, where do you see that going? How do you, do you think that the role of digitization and that the digital environment is playing, is, is different and is going to be different in the future as leaders yourselves? How do you think you will work with the space? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, for me and for most of the communities and, and elders and, and even young Aboriginal students that I work with, there's a real, it's very, very difficult to kind of imagine any digital space that could ever replace a cultural space. Really good digital spaces can augment it. And when it's done really well, it supports what's already happening with communities on the ground. It doesn't detract. Um, but I suppose it's, it will always just be a tool to support what's happening. And while there's still so much dysfunction and disadvantage and discrimination, it's, it's very difficult to think aspirationally about these tools because we are really still trying to, to correct a lot of issues with the past. Um, I think for education, for a lot of things, the technology is used because it's easy and it works. But in a cultural context, um, as Ian mentioned, we're starting to see digital protocols, but the, the digital protocols used are, are always echoes of the ones that are based on country and on face-to-face -face interactions. So I, I haven't seen um, things like, you know, UX studies based on, on First Nations people. I haven't seen a lot of this being taken to a sophisticated point where we're actually trying to understand if there are different needs at that level for, for First Nations people, or whether it really just does come back to, to how much time and effort we're all still putting in just to rebuild and maintain what we already have. So it's a silly question. No, that, that does. And I'd like to wind in Moena and Beck and Tristan at this point, if you've got a moment to very quickly before we all have to run away. Um, you used the word augment then, Damien, and I think that goes to what um, both that all or everyone has actually been saying and has threaded this lovely session together in that we've been thrust into this space as we've all been echoing that same sentiment over and over again. But has it and it has it given us just that opportunity to augment what we're we're doing perhaps in the moment and not knowing what we will promise the future, because we're not going to promise the future anything other than staying in this moment at the moment. Do you think that, that that digital environment is augmenting those experiences for all of our different cohorts and, and, air and audiences that we're interested in? Tristan, Moen, Beck, Beck? <laughs> I mean, Celia, for all the Queen's men, jumping into this digital space for a very specific demographic has been actually the most positive thing that we wouldn't have even imagined was going to be a place that this particular project and this kind of work would land. And as Tristan was saying earlier, we'll absolutely take it moving forward because it is augmenting more and more people that we can connect to and support and, and give them as much joy as we can in a, in a variety of ways. So, yeah, this, this has been a massive opportunity for us to learn about how we can augment our practice, how we can genuinely connect to people on their terms relative to what they need as the world keeps changing. I think the point that um, Damien and Ian make around um, a long living culture is also incredibly inspiring and important because obviously um, our commitment uh, to the LGBTI uh, elders, older people community is also a lifelong um, commitment from all the Queen's men as well. So we are having to augment and be responsive and, and learn and listen to communities every day through individual crisis, through community crisis, through national crisis, through social, cultural and demographic discrimination that is faced by a marginalised group. And so the the idea that um, we will shift or change or have to do um, uh, re refine our practice um, only because of this situation is something that we, we haven't experienced. It's something that we are learning and working with uh, on a daily basis. And many people are experiencing social isolation, uh, have experienced social isolation way before uh, the great pause that many other people have 
um, are experiencing currently. And so the privileges that, um, you know, some people's understanding around some limited understandings of what social isolation or lack of connection and culture means is not uh, the experience of a lot of people before this time. And so for, for us learning and also listening to the inspiring um, uh, uh, panelists here today has really augmented the way that we would like to continue working. And I guess our charge as artists is not to uh, use this opportunity to stop and pause, but to realize that if we are committed to community and communities that um, we will be augmenting and pivoting and shifting and using whatever language we want to on a daily basis to ensure that we're actually doing the work that we want to do. What you know, I would like to quickly dovetail on what Tristan has said, if that's all right, Celia, just quickly. Yeah, yeah, Moena just has to leave, I think, to, to duck off. Do you have to leave, Moena? Are you right to stay for a second? Uh, I, I do, but, but Ian, you go and then I'll go and then I'll say goodbye. No, you sure, Moena? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So good to see your face. I've missed you. I know, nice Last to see time you. I saw you were in the theatre together. We were. <laughs> Back in the old days. Back in the old days. Speaking of the old days and speaking about what Tristan said, I've been going to my elders and, of course, isolation isn't a new thing. Only recently, of course, last Wednesday was the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the anniversary of the referendum. Uh, and only four generations back, five generations back, my people never saw ships, you know. Um, so what I think is very interesting about this notion, I've been talking to the old ones around different language groups and they used to, particularly the Queensland mob and, you know, um, some mob out in WA. Anyway, all these mobs have been talking to me about, you know, having to sign in and sign out of missions, being controlled where and who and what you could say and how you could say it and taking children and doing all of these things. Now, this is not my government opinion. These are the facts. And these are the, what I've been hearing from my, aunt, my elders. And it, it, what has provided great um, opportunity for um, the custodianship program um, is having an elder in residence who grew up in a mission and who's talking about this will pass and you're in your ancestralness, in your, in your ability, as in your blood memory, your people have taught you skills to be isolated and to deal in isolation. The LGBTQI community only recently went through it when we had our own pandemic, where people wouldn't hire us because of HIV AIDS. And now we've overcome that. So, you know, I just, you know, I, what I, the last thing I'll say is, about looking backwards, Moana, about what we were just discussing in the old days. I don't think, and to ask what your question was, Celia, about what, how do we reinvent this? What is this about, you know, this digital world? I don't think the wheel is useful because if we've got the wheel, we're constantly chasing down the hill and we're not looking backwards. And we have what's called, in what I've studied at New York University, cognitive narrowing occurring so that we don't see the peripherals of what's on the side until it affects us all, which the COVID-19 has. But if we look at something like the boomerang, which created the helicopter, if you will, you throw it and it comes back. Pretty simple aerodynamics. And if you didn't, you got yourself a nice piece of KFC. So the wonderful thing about the boomerang is that it teaches us to look backwards, to look forward. How can we look at what our solutions that have given to us by our people of diversity, of disability, of LGBT, of First Nations, of Black people who are now protesting in the middle of a pandemic internationally, to start to consider how we can look forward? So I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ian. Mm. Um, yeah, Ian, man, you've got away with words. That's such a lovely summary. Um, I think, you know, I think we've got, we've had such an interesting representation from different communities um, today. And a lot of the answers to a lot of these questions, I think, are within these communities and um, the disability community as well is, is one that is no stranger to isolation um, and I think when we think about what the world looks like going forward it's not going to be the same as it was and hopefully a lot of the hopefully a lot of the good things that we've learned coming out of all of this um, in terms of you know being able to access things in new ways with new platforms um, 
new mediums will continue, um, you know, and widen things up for everyone even even further, I think would be the goal. I, we've gone over time and I did make a promise to everybody that we wouldn't go over time. So I'm very sorry, but thank you, thank you, thank you to our wonderful panellists, Damien, Ian, Moena, Beck and Tristan. Thank you to our Auslan interpreters, Bettina and Elisa. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us again. If you would like us to discuss something, send it through the digital solutions at australiacouncil.gov.au. Go back to the Facebook page, have a look at the conversation that's ongoing. Um, don't forget we have Creative Connections and the First Nations Roundtable on Friday. We also have added in one other webinar just because we, uh, we love doing webinars. Um, another one with our pattern makers research um, as the facts sheet start to come to life for that. So please let us know if there's anything else. We are listening. I've taken away absolutely everything from today's session and we are in this together. Remember that lovely message from this week. See you later. Bye.